Hey folks, uh, thanks for joining us today for Coffee and Code Platoon. I'm Kayla, I'm on the marketing team and Greg is also here, probably gonna be answering the majority of the questions. Um, but while we're getting started, I think we'll wait an extra minute just to make sure everyone who wants to arrive gets in so we're all on the same page. Um, and then uh, we'll get started at that point. Uh, by the way, you're welcome to be on camera or off camera or speak into the microphone or keep yourself muted and just write messages into the chat. Um, either way is totally fine. Um, the only thing I would say is if we have a lot of questions, uh, maybe raise your hand or use a react before speaking just to make sure we don't like interrupt each other. But uh, I think that's all on my end. Greg, why don't you introduce yourself as we're getting started? Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us at another uh, edition of Coffee and Code Platoon. We appreciate you guys joining us. I see at least one uh, recognizable name, Thomas. Good to see you again. Um, for Like Kayla said, we're going to take a minute just to make sure everybody has uh, a minute to join. In the meantime, of course, because it's the theme of Coffee and Code Platoon, write down in the comment section your favorite coffee and why it's better than everybody else's choice. I, I like any kind of Zoom argument we can get going is great. Um, I personally am a fan of Lavazza. That's the choice today, Lavazza coffee. But uh, if you have a favorite, please share. I'm always happy to taste test new brands. I'm, I'm a coffee snob. So um, as we're getting going, let's see here. A couple people still joining. A couple people more being admitted. So yeah, if you got a favorite coffee, tell me why it's better than mine. Oh, another thing while we're getting started, if you don't mind just putting in the group chat kind of where you are, if you've started an application with Code Platoon, if you haven't started an application, if you've already been accepted, um, any answer is totally fine, but uh, it would just be nice to kind of know where people are so we're not giving too much information or not enough information. All right, John, it looks like he's doing intro to coding. Awesome. Good deal. Yeah, and if you haven't started intro to coding, we'll probably mention it about 10 times in this uh, this effort here, but intro to coding, intro to coding, intro to coding. It's kind of like location in real estate. It's really fundamental to what we do. So definitely check that out. Uh, dialing in from Houston, have not started app yet. Kentucky started application. Welcome Houston and Kentucky. Thomas, I know you're got you've gotten started, so right on. Um, yeah, but hey, I think you know we've got people, we've got enough people here, so we can go ahead and start. For those of you unaware, the the whole effort here at Coffee and Code Platoon is very informal, and the idea is to offer up a Q and A period where it's it's you just ask whatever questions you have. Uh, most of the time, very common that you have the same questions that other people do, so. When you ask a question, you know, I'll be answering and everybody pays attention and that spurs more questions and so on and so forth. So I am here to answer whatever questions you have. Um, again, like I said at the beginning, intro to coding. If you haven't started it yet, start it now. Uh, that's a that's a great pipeline into this program on a, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's you learning the skill. You're starting to learn it and you're learning it for free in terms of monetary costs. Yes, your time is worth something, but that's what you're going to invest into any endeavor that you embark upon. So invest your time in the intro to coding. It'll help answer a couple of questions. Number one, it'll help give you an idea of how to get into this program and how to start your career. But it'll also help you answer the question of, is this right for me? Uh, you get deep into intro to coding, you'll start figuring out real quick, do I really want to be a software engineer? And that will help you answer that question. Unlike a lot of disciplines in the world where you have to go through two to four years of school before you even get to do the job, coding, software development, you're starting to learn it right away. So it's, it's pretty cool that you can do so much for free. Uh, let's see. So just kicking it off, do we have any initial questions? Any Anything based on what you've seen so far, what you've heard so far? Do you have Does that spur any questions for anyone? Nothing. Yeah. I, I, sorry, my, my 
Girls get a little bit chatted up there. Uh, good afternoon from Houston, Texas. Yeah, I'm interested in maybe if you can talk a little bit about the distinctions and differences between DevOps and, and software engineering. Um, interested, both, both my wife and I are interested. That's why she's not jumping on the call. But um, had an opportunity to kind of look at a, a little bit of the background or like the differences, but uh, not, it's not quite clear to me. So I don't know maybe if you can talk about, A, the differences between the two, and then, B, <clears throat> how the programs between those two um, are differentiated and, 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 and similar. Um, we're, we're looking at potentially the uh, weekend um, or the part-time program remote, um, if those are available. I think there's one at least uh, later on in the fall for each of those that's going to be started, I think September, October, November timeframe. And so we're potentially considering uh, one of those two, but we wanted to learn a little bit more about the distinction between both of those and then the similarities between them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that the best place to start is kind of at the the last thing you said there is that the similarities. Uh, and that's important to note because in the world of software engineering right now, it will depend a lot on how big your team is, what the differentiation is between DevOps and software engineering. So for example, the engineers I've spoken to, if you're on a team of, let's say five people, um, you're going to be doing, there's a lot of overlap. Whereas if you're on a team of a lot larger, you know, scale and size, the DevOps role is a bit more differentiated. Now, the analogy that I've came up, come up with that I've bounced this off of several uh, people in the industry, and they seem to say is, is fairly accurate. I like to put things in military terms because that's who we're dealing with, right? So I want everybody to imagine a tank. We're going to field a new tank under the field of battle. Uh, the person who is interacting with both sides of the house, the person who is dealing with the ground level engineers and the person who is de dealing with the end user, so the actual tank drivers and the tankers in the military, that's going to be closer to your DevOps engineer. It's bridging that gap between the, cre the base level creation process and that end user and making sure that it's functioning properly as per the user wants to, you know, the tank driver gets in it and says, hey, this is this part sucks. This doesn't work. Fix this. The DevOps engineer is like, okay, cool. I'm going to take that back to the engineers. Whereas the software engineer is that base level creation, right? They're the people who are, who are writing the plans that bring up the very creative aspect of this. Another way to think about it is DevOps is going to be a little bit more on the process perfection level and software engineers is going to be a little bit more on the creative base level. Again, there's going to be a lot of overlap here and it's important to note that. However, and this is where this gets a little tricky and I want everybody to you know put their thinking caps on for this. In terms of starting, nobody up until 2023 Nobody started as a DevOps engineer. And the reason I can say that definitively is because nobody prior to Code Platoon launching their, our DevOps program had a standalone DevOps program. Nobody. We were, if not the very first, one of the very first schools to have a dedicated DevOps curriculum. What this means is that everybody who occupied the title and role of a DevOps engineer nearly all of them started as a software engineer and moved into DevOps engineering. Does this mean it can't be done as a starting place? Not necessarily, but it does mean that the data on people starting as a DevOps engineer is next to zero. Like we just don't have the data because we've had very small cohorts so, so far. We've only had a few graduates. And as a result, we directed our program more towards industry professionals, which is why it can only be done in the evening and weekend model. You can't do the DevOps engineering as a, as a full immersive program. So, and the kind of the reasoning behind that is just tied back to what I was saying a minute ago. Everybody who wanted to do DevOps was already working in a career and couldn't give that up. I think that helps make some decisions because... Again, that doesn't mean you can't go directly into DevOps and cloud engineering. It means that there is very little data on people starting out in that because nearly everyone has started out in, um, you know, software engineering first and then moved into DevOps. So I don't know if that kind of helps address your questions. Yeah, I mean, from a Navy guy, I don't know about the whole tank, uh, you know, <laughs> correlation, but, you know. Let's go with a submarine. Like, Let's go with a submarine. Submarine or destroyer, I probably could have made the link. No, I'm just joking. It makes sense. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, all, all great insights, and I appreciate you kind of uh, clarifying that. A uh, couple other follow-up questions then. <clears throat> what are the, 
what are the sim similarities in terms of skill sets and then the, 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 the different skill sets between both of those? And is it maybe your Code Platoon's recommendation to maybe if you want to move into dev DevOps, maybe start off with software engineering and maybe easier to kind of move into DevOps or is the program set up uh, for folks who don't come from a software engineering background to kind of get you up to speed if you want to move into DevOps and without having to go through a software engineering background? Uh, the similarities, like I'd say the best place to start for both is to learn a lot of Python. So I mean, Python is going to be your fundamental language for both of those, right? So starting out there and then as you're learning Python, start digging into, because here's where this gets a little bit tricky. A ask more people than just me, right? Because you're going to get different answers. And I encourage people on this topic specifically that you're going to get different answers from different people based on where they work and what they do, right? A, a person who works on a team at some massive organization is going to have a little bit different view of DevOps than the person who works on a smaller software development team. They're just, it's going to be varied. That doesn't mean one's right, one's wrong. It just helps to get a more robust perspective. But either way, Python is going to be one of your fundamental tools that will apply to both of those. So what I would, what I, my best recommendation right now is to start learning as much Python as possible because it's going to apply to your application process either way. And as you're learning that, start investigating this question, like start reading some of the testimonials on our website. Um, I think Caleb probably, we have a page that has a couple of testimonials from professionals uh, somewhere. We'll, we'll find that and share it in the chat. Um, and that way you're not just getting my perspective, but you know, theoretically, can you start as a DevOps engineer there? Um, yes. I mean, theoretically you can, it's going to be much more of a precision based, a lot less on the creation side. So it kind of depends on like, if you want to create and have a lot of leeway in creating things, software engineering is definitely decidedly the best place to start. If you're absolutely all about process improvement, making sure a process runs perfectly, that's more on the DevOps side. The real question, like you're asking, the practical one is, can you get there from the beginning? Um, I don't, I mean, that's where it's tricky is because again, we've had so few students. I mean, understand that our students, a couple of our students who went through DevOps went through our full stack program first and then went to DevOps directly, which makes them terrible for a data set, right? Because we, if we're looking at these people like, well, yeah, we could say they got a job, but they also have this robust understanding of both. And so did they get the job based on that? You know, and so it's really tricky. And when I say small cohorts, we're talking three to four people. Um, I think we've only had, Kayla, do you know how many total graduates we've had of DevOps? Because we only started this year. I would say 11. Um, 11, 11 it might total. be off by one, but I think 11 so far, because we've had two cohorts. The first one had six, the second one had five, if I remember correctly. And at least... At least a couple of those, like I said, were also Code Platoon graduates, and several of the others were people who already worked in the industry. In fact, I think most of them. In other words, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is just add some caution and say, I can't tell you definitively because the data set is so small, right? I, I don't want to downplay the effectiveness of our program, but I also don't want to oversell and tell you, oh, we've got 80% placement rate, but we have 11 people, right? And if if seven of them already worked in the in the industry, that's a terrible model for telling you one way or the other on that question. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I absolutely does make sense. And so I, I appreciate the the clarity and um, you know just frankness. And so uh, it kind of it does give us kind of a better idea of uh, you know one the differences between the two and similarities between both of them, and then um, and then like you said, you know if you kind of a starting place. A common starting place is just Python for either one of them. And as you kind of start to move forward, just investigate, ask more questions. Yes. Uh, get different perspectives. And, you know, folks that are maybe in the industry right now and say, hey, look, is it recommended going from software engineering to DevOps? Or maybe right. is it, if you come if, if you come from a program like Cold Platoon that's strictly focused on, on DevOps, is that something that maybe hiring managers would be okay with, right? So... Uh, it, does, it does clarify, and, 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 and thank you for, for sharing your perspectives. 
Yeah. And like I said, it's like any other thing, any other discipline, any of you ever go into, the more you learn, the more you know questions to ask that you didn't know before. And that's why I suggest starting on that skill set. Like start learning the skill, start learning um, Python, go watch our DevOps graduation videos. Uh, for those unaware, our graduation videos are one of the best places to start for our program. Not because this is not a graduation video like us handing people certificates and, you know, saying, ah, congratulations. It, it's the students debuting their final project. And so you will get to see what it is a DevOps engineer is actually making. Like, what, what am I talking about when I say DevOps engineering? Well, they're doing a final project. Software engineering, the full stack program does final projects that you can say, ah, that's what I'm working towards. That's And that's a great place to start for that is to start watching those graduation videos and hearing them explain what they're doing. And that way you'll have a really robust understanding of, all right, what am I getting into? Right. It's software engineering is very basic. Like you, you can see, oh, they're making websites, they're making apps, et cetera. So you can see the end result of what you're working towards. Um, John asked a question, how long does it take to become a software engineer and what can you do upon gaining the base level skill? Indie game development. So this is a good place. I think it's a good tie in actually. Um, how long does it take to become a software engineer? Well, there's this is one of those questions where there's two answers. Uh, we can say from a code platoon perspective, six months ish. And we can also say forever. Um, the reason to answer that way is because this is an area where you can never learn everything. There's too much to learn. So we are a full stack program, which means we're teaching front end and back end development. Nearly everyone will pick a direction to go with that. You're going to be a specialist in front end development, or you're going to have a more, you know, greater attraction to back end development. And you're going to go down that path. And there's infinite number of things you can develop on each path. For those unaware, in case those terms are new to you, I suppose I should just explain this real quick. Front end and back end development, the best way to explain how this is differentiated. Look at a website that we're all familiar with because it sucks us all in, Amazon, right? We spend way too much money and time on Amazon so we can all relate. The things you're looking at, the, the buttons you're clicking on, the pictures you're seeing on Amazon, that's front end development. That's the user interface, like what you're interacting with. That's all front-end development. Where your data goes. So when you put in a credit card or what you, your browsing history is or your purchase history is and where that is stored, that's back-end development, where all of those things are going. And everybody's going to have a preferred skill. Like, do I, am I more into data management and data manipulation? Or am I more into visual creation and things like that? Those are going to be two aspects of full-stack development. But the point being is that you can go on a never ending rabbit trail of knowledge and never exhaust all the things that you need to know to be an amazing software engineer, or software developer. If you go into gaming development, that's going to be a different track than something like banking or banking and finance. A huge number of our clients are in the banking world, right? We have a lot of people in the financial industry. A lot of people don't realize that's a huge employer of software engineers. JP Morgan Chase, a bank that we've partnered with in the past, uh, they have more software development than Microsoft does. I was surprised to learn that when I started working here. They dump more money into tech development than Microsoft. So there's a lot of ends of this industry that you can go down that will teach you that there is more to know. It's like me, I'm a, I'm a liberal arts major, I'm a history major. You're never going to be an expert in one area or, you know, history in general. It's just way too big. Software is kind of the same thing. You can specialize in one area. But you're going to have to specialize in that area and you'll never be an expert in another. Um, in terms of game development, does this give you the base level skills to start down that path? Yes, it's going to give you the base level skills because you're learning to write and read code and produce things that happen on a screen with that. That's the fundamental aspect of all software development. Re reading, writing code, manipulation of code, all of that is the base level so in that way, like what I like to tell people is that Code Platoon is like a language school, right? We want you to deploy overseas. We want you to deploy to Iraq. And we want to give you a fundamental level uh, understanding in Arabic. Bam, crash course at DLI, right? That's what all the military does is go to DLI and have a six month or a year long crash course in that language. What you do with that, you know, what you're using to interpret and use it for can be can be wildly variable, right? Depends on who you're talking to, what you're doing overseas, any number of things, but you have the base level skill to start down that path. 
Um, begin with the end in mind type of thing from Thomas. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much accurate. Like lear start learning the fundamental skill and it will open up questions that you hadn't even really considered, which I think is, again, going back to what I said at the beginning, it's really helpful in this, this industry in particular is that you can start learning the skill right away. Uh, I contrast that all the time with my wife. My wife's a nurse. She had to go through two years of training before she could ever actually treat a patient at the bedside and find out like, oh, you get kicked and bitten and punched and nasty stuff like that. It's like, I, you, a lot of people didn't know that's what nursing is, right? Because you went through, but you went through two years of schooling. Code writing, software engineering, you're starting off learning the skill. And I think that's really helpful. Uh, I'm a DLI grad twice. Oh, well, Mark, great to hear because our DLI grads typically do very well. Um, in fact, if you want to, well, we'll be putting, I'll be putting this up later or Kayla will be actually probably, I'll be conducting an interview with several of our linguist graduates, uh, later this afternoon. And we'll be posting that up on, on Code Platoon's feed. So be aware that I'll be having a conversation specifically related to language development and how that helps you become a better software engineer. So we've had a disproportionate number of uh, linguists come through our program. So I think it's a great foundation. Oddly enough, we've had a lot of musicians too. Um, odd number of band people come through Code Platoon, so which is pretty cool. Um, so at any rate, if you're a if you're a DLI grad, great to hear. It's a great foundation for what we do. A lot of people don't realize coding Python, JavaScript. These are languages you know, everybody wants to think about it as math. Well, in some levels, you can think of math as a language too. Uh, these are languages, right? So having the ability to differentiate different <laughs> symbols and turn them into, you know, coherent thoughts, that's a fundamental part of what code writing is. Um... I guess I have a, a question really quick, and it kind of has to do, like you said, your, your, your major is history. That's actually something I'm it's always been in the back of my mind, um, but it, I guess the, the more appropriate question for here would be, you know, what if you don't really know what you want to do necessarily? I mean, I could presumably, you know, say I graduate and finish this and go work at J.P. Morgan Chase or whatever, but I guess my, I've always wanted to be more independent, basically, uh, financially, just so whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of like, I guess my general idea for why I want to learn this skill specifically, because I want to be able to make my own websites. I want to be able to run the back ends of them. I want to be able to do, you know, these things like create some kind of, uh, if, if, if it's not a main source of income, then a secondary source of income. Uh, and, and history is kind of one of those things that, that, um, is like a topic of interest, but I'll probably, I'm, I'm, um, also on the financial side of things, I'm, signed up at least for, or at least I'm, I'm awaiting approval for the, not vet tech funding, but what's the, um, the v, Voc Rehab? VRNE, yeah. Yeah, v, VRE. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, there's an, uh, it's been said for probably thousands of years, but one of the best ways to figure out your, your path in life, and this is just kind of a general advice from the 50-year-old guy here who's done a lot of different things, is to just jump in and start doing it. Uh, and this is why I harp on, on learning things like intro to coding first is because it's free other than your time. You can dig in and start figuring out, you know, is this something I'm really into? And even if you enjoy it partially, here's the thing. It's like we all learned English, presumably in school, right? At some point, does that mean you had to be an English major? No, but it, it opened up a lot of doors to do other things. You know, to be a history major, I had to have a decent command of the English language. Doesn't mean I want to be an English major, and I still don't. Um, but also, just a piece of advice, <laughs> be careful going into history, because, yeah, you're not going to find a earn a living very well. But <laughs> that's that's just a knock on me. Um, you'll end up as a recruiter at a tech, you know, you know which is great. I, I like I like doing this, and I like helping veterans and people who are coming out of the military and trying to figure out their path in life. So this has been very rewarding, but the, the biggest piece of advice I have for you is, like I said, dig in, start doing it. And the, at the very least, let's say you get a year or two years into being a software developer and you're like, this isn't really me, who cares? It's like learning carpentry. That's going to come in handy somewhere, right? If you learn how to cut boards and hammer nails and do that effectively, I don't care if you're never a carpenter, at some point in your life, you're going to be like, that's 
that came in really handy knowing how knowing that fundamental skill so I, the best way to investigate that is just to just to dig in and and start going because that can open up so many other doors like i said and the, the blending of tech and other disciplines whether it be liberal arts or you know medical science or banking whatever software engineering is at the core of nearly everything right now everything is is wrapped up in this and so if you can learn to read and write javascript and python man, you, you've got a fundamental skill under your belt that's going to help you no matter what you do. Uh, Kayla pointed out the uh, quick pass. Let's talk about quick pass. So the, the Before question- we do that, actually, can we yeah. get, I saw a question that I think we may have accidentally skipped and I just want to make oh, sure miss? he gets his question answered. It was yeah. about how many hours of coding should you have before you start the full stack application coding challenges? Okay, okay. Um, so- there's a couple ways to answer this. Number one, obviously intro to coding is there to help you develop the fundamental skills. Some people can breeze through that. Some people are already coming with some experience. Some people are, are starting at ground zero. So it there is no set number of hours it's going to take you. But what I will say, and this is this is the probably the helpful practical part of this, please understand that the coding challenges on part two of the application are not timed. Now, why is that important in this context? Because you can start, so the, the questions, there's 12 total questions, at least 10 of which have to be answered on the coding challenges on part two of our application. They get progressively harder. So one and two are easier than nine and 10. But if you start and you're, you're going through intro to coding, you're like, I'm learning this, but I don't know how well I'm learning it. How good do I need to be? You don't have to be 100% prepared before starting those challenges. You can start and maybe you're ready to do challenge number one and you finish that. And you're like, cool, I submitted that and I did well on it. And maybe even number two is good. And you submit that. And then you get to question three and you go, whoa, that's maybe I need to learn a little bit more. You can go do that. You can take weeks to do the challenges on the second part of the application. This is not something you have to sit down and be 100% prepared for to start. You can be partially prepared and start it and then go partially prepare more and do the rest, so on and so forth. So as long as you're aware of, of the deadline of the actual program, so we have you know whatever code, whatever cohort you're applying to is going to have a cohort deadline. And we're going to get into that in a minute when we talk about quick pass. But every cohort is going to have a deadline. As long as you're mindful of that, the application challenges, you can take weeks and even months to do them. And there is no penalty. We don't score extra points because you did all the challenges in the afternoon. In fact, I don't even know that our instructors would be able to tell how long it took you. Once you get out of code platoon and you're applying to jobs, that's not going to be the case. You will do similar things, but that's what we're preparing you for too. You will come to a website like CoderBite and they'll say you have two hours to answer X number of questions and also your computer's locked down so that you can't look anywhere else for resources. We're not doing that. We're, we're getting the base level out of the way and you're starting from that point. So don't think you have to be 100% prepared before you submit the application. Now, that offers a great segue into something that we're offering for the second time. Is that correct, Kayla? Second time, quick pass. Second time we've offered this, we did it last cohort for the first time. And this is something that is going to occur after the deadline. And basically, it's another way of kind of doing the same thing. We're still bringing you up to speed. We're still teaching you the same thing. You're still expected to gain the same amount of knowledge but you are having an instructor help you along with that process. And it's kind of an immersive and it's exactly what it's, what the name suggests quick pass. It's a way of going through this program with an instructor to help prepare you for those challenges. You still have to pass the challenges. You still have to do a live technical when it's done, but it's another way of getting in. That's not just you doing this all on your own. So if you're right now, because we are, what, a week away from the deadline for X-Ray Platoon, if you're a week away and you're like, man, this is too much, I, like, I can't get all of this done by March 31st, there's no way, all hope is not lost. We have a solution to this program. I think last cohort, we admitted how many through Quick Pass? Kayla, do you have the number? 10. 20? 10. I was a little bit off. Um, 10 people. So 10 people got in through Quick Pass uh, the last cycle. 
So I think Kayla is going, do you have a link for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we, tech we technically aren't going to be announcing this quick pass until after the x-ray application deadline passes, but the registration it form is open. And if you want to register early, if you are one of those people where maybe you figured out about Code Platoon like three days ago and you're like, there's no way I'm going to be able to complete the coding challenges before March 31st, uh, this would be a really great way to get into the program. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, Quick Pass is, is a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, for those, like, as we're introducing this, it is important to note one thing though, either way, start on intro to coding, right? Start, because that's still going to help you. Even if you were planning on going to Quick Pass, don't put it off until Quick Pass starts. Start learning intro to coding now. Start going through the, the languages and start understanding these concepts between now and then. And that way you're, you're just that much further ahead. Um, I've <laughs> Thomas, I saw your, your comment. I've actually been reading through and doing exercises on Murocs Python. I read that as Monty Python and that really threw me. I was like, why are we reading through Monty Python to help prepare? That sounds but like a really fun way to learn to code though. <laughs> also, maybe it works. There's a lot of secret knowledge in Monty Python. I got to say, it's, it's probably a collection of wisdom unlike any other. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. I have two more questions if we have time, but I want to give others the opportunity to ask their questions. I think cool. that uh, you're you're good to go. Uh, yeah, you can ask whatever whatever questions you've got. I mean, go for it. Um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that sounds like a great name for a startup, then, right? Monty Python coding. Um, <laughs> Holy Grail of Python knowledge. That's it. That's it. Uh, so, two questions then. Through the part time program, whether it's software engineering or or DevOps. Is there support on the back end after graduation for the types of um, uh, internship type of uh, uh, support or, or the apprenticeships? That's one. And then the second one, if I recall correctly, getting a, a email from Code Platoon a couple you know months back that they're going to start integrating uh, AI capabilities into the curriculum. So if you if maybe you can expand and touch a little bit on that. So those two questions there. Thank you. Yeah. Great, great question. So I'm glad you didn't didn't wait uh, because I think the the first question especially is one that a lot of people have, and it's one that I enjoy speaking about simply because it's a focus of Code Platoon in general. So understand that this is really important to understand about our ethos, our philosophy. Code Platoon started with the intent of launching careers. Software engineering is a way of helping do that, right? So software engineering and the skills that you need, that's the tool. But the ultimate goal and the way we measure success is you launching your career. And the reason I say that is because I think this is in distinction to the modern university program, which is essentially there to give you a robust education. That may be good, that might be bad. I mean, I've spent way more time at university than I needed to. But the point is, our metric for success is you launching a career, not just having a head full of knowledge. So as a result, the career services aspect of what we do is taken very, very seriously. Our career services team starts working with you upon graduation, and we have what I call a top-down and bottom-up approach. So the bottom-up is working with you as the individual to help prepare your resume, you know, utilizing the skills that you had in the military and maximizing whatever skills it was that you acquired and experience you had, using those you know resume building tools that helped get you in the door, interviewing skills, which in software engineering is its own special thing. And software engineering interviews are going to be a little bit different than what most people are used to. It's not just a behavioral interview. It's sometimes technical questions. We help prepare you for that. So there's the bottom up, the human part of it, but then there's the top down, which is us working to form partnerships with companies that will hire our graduates and who trust us as a program that's producing good quality graduates, programs that want military graduates, people who want to you know, build up their own company by using the experience that military people bring that other people don't necessarily have. You know, the 22-year-old the computer science grad is not going to come with the same type of experience that an 8, 10, 12-year veteran of the military is bringing. They're just not. And a lot of companies are recognizing this. Those are the companies that we try to partner with and say, hey, we've got these, these people who have this amazing skill set and experience, but also we've developed their, you know, their software engineering capabilities and skills. 
So the career services part of what we do is very important, number one, but two, the people who do it are super motivated and they're great to work with. Uh, our career services team, I, I love them to death. They're, they're very passionate and motivated about helping you launch your career. You know, not just, oh, you know, here's a couple of job links and I'm going to throw them your way. No, they're, they're there forever. If you're a Code Platoon graduate, they're going to help you however they can. So I think that's a, that's a really great part. We, and by the way, we do have a YouTube, uh, there's a video on our YouTube channel somewhere of me interviewing our career services team, going into more specifics. So if you want to know, like, what does that look like? Yeah, Greg just said a bunch of fancy things that make it sound all motivational. Cool, but what does that actually look like? I do an actual interview with our career services team where they kind of break that down and, and show what it looks like to have, you know, career services helping you. And part of that, as you mentioned, uh, apprenticeships. Apprenticeships were one of the only, if not the only coding bootcamp out there that has apprenticeship opportunities upon graduation. Now, these are limited. These are not the, not everybody that graduates Code Platoon is going to land an apprenticeship. They are most commonly, in fact, almost always in Chicago, Usually, I think we've seen a couple pop up that were remote or in other locations, and we're trying. We're trying to expand that. That's not to say that most of Code Platoon graduates are in Chicago. It's just that most of our apprenticeship connections are in the city of Chicago. So that is some, and that's for those unaware, an apprenticeship is the actual paid apprenticeship program that starts immediately after graduation. Great opportunity if you can make it to Chicago to attend, either attend in person or be here after the program um, finishes. Awesome. I should, I should clarify, be here. I'm not in Chicago. I'm in Colorado. Um, but here, meaning Code Platoon. So just to clarify on that. Now, the, I think your other question was, uh, the second part of your question was AI. AI tools. Understand, here's where I'm going to claim a lot of ignorance. So the best place, I think, to start is go to our most recent graduation video. I mentioned the graduation videos earlier. The most recent graduation video, which was Victor. Victor, Platoon, Kayla, correct me if I'm wrong. Was it Victor? Whiskey's going to DevOps one after Victor, but um, yeah, there's there's a couple that have started using AI. And when Whiskey graduates um, in a month, that'll be another good one to look at to yeah. see how they're integrating AI. Yeah. So the best the best way to answer that question, because I not being a developer myself, like I'd probably get pretty tongue tied trying to explain. I'd, I'd be making stuff up, frankly, if I was telling you specifically, how are we incorporating AI? I'm not the expert here. Um, the best way to, to answer that is go to our most recent graduation videos. And they're starting to incorporate the use of large language models in their, you know, in their website creation and various things that they're doing. Um, and I think just see it and have them explain it would be way better than me kind of giving. The important thing here though, and I think from a conceptual perspective, the important thing to address here is that this is why coding boot camps became a thing in the first place. University programs have a very hard time adapting to rapid change, right? Whereas something like chat GPT-4 drops and hits the world and everybody goes, oh, what are we doing with this? A coding boot camp, a small coding boot camp has the ability to change its curriculum and adapt to new technologies so much faster. And that's exactly what we did, right? So that's probably the most important thing to recognize is that we are in a constant evolutionary mindset of, a, of giving our students the tools that they need to, to succeed now. Not what was successful five years ago, not was successful for the last 10 years. What's hot, you know, what is most important right now? And still to this day, believe it or not, JavaScript and Python. If you Google top in-demand coding languages, most people's lists are going to include JavaScript and Python in the top five. There's always going to be a different ordering and all that, depending on who you ask. But those two are going to be fundamental. And for anybody will, you know, and I'll head off a potential question here. A lot of people started asking, is, are things like Chad GPT-4, is that going to take jobs away from software engineers? There was a recent study done at, I believe it was Columbia University, and it was a, in the economics department, if I recall correctly, where it actually showed that companies that were investing more heavily in large language models were employing more software engineers, not fewer. And the idea here is that it's, it's kind of like a trash cleanup. And Thomas, I think you'll remember, I used this analogy in the last the last coffee and code platoon, 
I started out as an airborne infantryman, right? And I thought that I was going to be doing nothing but jumping out of planes and shooting and moving and communicating. I had more experience with a broom and a mop in my first year as a private than I had with anything else, right? I would I qualified expert on broom and mop multiple times. I was awesome. I was a marksman. But the point is, like the analogy here is that in the world of large language models and the world of things like chat GBT4, what we're seeing is that this is taking away the mop and the broom. You still have the core fundamental job of shooting, moving, and communicating, right? The same fundamental core aspect of an infantryman would, infantryman would still be there, but now I have a robot that's picking up trash and mopping floors for me. Right? So it just it, it clears up some of those, those easier kind of trash jobs and makes the overall job more efficient and I can do more. And it's like the old joke that we had in the infantry. Yeah, you made, you made the equipment lighter, but what you did was made us carry more. So we're still carrying like 90 pounds. You look at the guy in World War II, he was carrying like the same weight. He just had fewer things. Kind of a similar deal here. It's enabling us to do more and more and more. Uh, I lucked out and got to do landscaping for my first year. And <laughs> there you go. Nice. Well, see, at least you were building. I was just mopping like floors that were 60 years old. I was like, you can only, you know. Anyway, that's a whole digression. Um, but yeah. What are the it, questions? Not to interrupt you, Greg, or anything. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, here we go. Uh, can you explain the process after the application is submitted? What is the live technical assessment and how does that go? Okay, the best way to explain that is to tie into what I was just talking about. With the advent of chat GPT-4, it is very possible to cheat on these coder byte applications. I'll be right up front and tell you right now that you can cheat on things like coder byte applications. However, you'll never get through the live technical assessment. You will be exposed as soon as you do the live technical assessment because that's what it's for. It's basically a, a live interaction with an instructor who is ensuring that you did not cheat on the application, which means it's not at a higher level. If you did the application legitimately, you did it all yourself, you answered the questions, you figured out how to do it, you will be just fine in the live technical assessment. If you cheated, you will not be fine. That's the best way to explain it. But it's it's basically a, a kind of insurance of, of saying, no, you really did it and making sure that you really know, you know how to address these questions. But again, it's not going to be at a higher level. Now, the process itself, here's what will happen. If you're accepted to code platoon, so you submit a whole application, you get accepted, you're offered the acceptance. And the first thing that you're invited to is a welcome call where you will meet the executive director. I'll be on the call and the enrollment person will be on the call and the instructor who evaluated your application. will all be on the call so that you can ask questions. After that call and answering some basic questions about things like enrollment and funding and things like that, then you go on to pre-work. We do give you pre-work that leads up to the program. We're not just saying, welcome to Code Platoon, you're accepted and we'll see you in two months. We're giving you pre-work to do that leads up to the start of the program so that you are as prepared as possible. All of this pre-work, by the way, is at the same level as the challenges. This isn't like, you know, we're not going to 200 level classes. We're still in kind of the 100 level classes and to just get you as prepared as possible. For those who do quick pass, quick pass kind of takes the place of that. So you'll be engaged. At e either way, you'll be engaged between that deadline and the start of the program. You'll be engaged as engaged as possible. So hopefully that uh, that answers that questions. Um, but just question. to summarize, for those of you who are a little like further back in the process, um, because I know we've had some questions and confusion around it before. Um, if you're looking at a cohort and you see application deadline March 31st, for example, that deadline is to submit the coding challenges and the form, which has a couple essays on it. That is not the deadline to complete the technical assessment that comes after the deadline. So you don't have to worry about cramming that in. Yes, thank you for that point. Um, yeah, you don't have to worry about cramming that all in by the deadline. And an, an important point too, there on the other other parts of part two of the application, because I get this question a lot. People say, well, what about these, these essays and the video? Don't worry too much about them. They have to be done. They do have to be done and submitted, but don't worry about the level of quality. Like these are not college level. We're not asking you to write the history of Python or write an essay on you know, why JavaScript is a language. Um, there's a reason why we do them, but you're not going to be 
failed out of your application because you misspelled stuff on your essay or, or you know, missed a couple things on your video. I, I've never seen someone denied entry into Code Platoon for making a poor video. We had we had a student, I think it was two cohorts ago, who submitted a video, the meeting the video requirements, mind you. He was in Kuwait in a sandstorm and he submitted a video talking about how to solve one of the coding challenges. It was terrible. It was shaky. He was doing this thing and he still answered it. And Guillermo, the instructor was like, cool, I got respect for that. So you're good. So don't, in other words, don't worry about the super high quality video and don't let that be a deterrent for making the, making the video. Um, important question here by Austin, totally loaded question here, but what in your opinion is the outlook for vet tech for fiscal year 25? That is, I wouldn't say it's a loaded question. It's an impossible question. Uh, there, there's a difference. No, so I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my take. Um, and for what it's worth, I, I did work in the political arena about 10 years ago. And so I kind of understand how these things work. Um, vet tech, for those un, unaware, I'll just give you a brief overview that will help explain some of this. Vet tech was always a pilot program. It was always designed and intended to end now. It would have all things going well. The pilot status of vet tech was supposed to end right now. It would have sunsetted anyway. However, the idea was if it was successful, Congress would make a permanent version of vet tech. And the idea is to make a, a forever vet tech that is kind of like the GI Bill. It does the same thing that vet tech does, but now it's permanent. It's no longer a pilot program. That bill, and if anybody wants to look it up, it's H.R. 1669. It passed the House, so it was created as a forever vet tech bill. It passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support. Awesome. Great. And then it went to the Senate Committee for Veterans Affairs, and it has sat there since last May. It is currently sitting in the Senate Committee for Veterans Affairs, doing whatever things do when they go to committee. They sit and they wait. Now, here's my hunch. Here's my take, and this is this is me purely speculating, but it's not from an uneducated perspective. A lot of the delays here have to do with the budget fights going on in Congress. Well, if you saw this morning, there was a big, the House just passed a big budget averting a shutdown. Does that mean that maybe, possibly, if we get that off the plate for the Senate, that they'll address the vet tech bill? Fingers crossed. I, that's all I can tell you is that fingers are crossed. I don't know. And nobody that I've talked to knows any more than that. I think the only people you could talk to are the senators who are actually in that committee and say, hey, what's going on? And maybe they could tell you, but everyone outside of that that I've talked to has no knowledge beyond that, whether or not vet tech, the forever vet tech bill will pass, whether or not it will pass before the end of this year. It's purely speculative. Um, I think any movement you see on budget, on congressional budget moves, in the right direction will be positive for that because it gets that off their plate and they can start working on things like vet tech. So here's to hoping that you know, knock on wood that this morning was good news. But I'm I'm with all of you right now is that I'm sitting and waiting. So just remember HR 1669. That's the bill to watch, um, and you know keep keep monitoring that and <laughs> act appropriately. I guess. So I wish I could give you better news than that, but that's where vet tech stands as of right now. Can we really quickly summarize the non-vet tech options available through yeah. VA benefits before we move on? Yes, great. And thank you for reminding me. So very quickly, there are two other options from the VA. And this is really important to remember that in, in a general sense, we have other funding options besides vet tech. Don't let vet tech be your determiner for code platoon attendance. That's been another, I mentioned at the beginning, Code Platoon's mission was to launch careers. The other part of that mission was to do so affordably, affordably and make sure that cost was not a, not a factor. Two options from the VA. Number one, the GI Bill. Now, unfortunately, the GI Bill has the single limitation of in-person attendance requirement. That's why that tech was invented in the first place, by the way, was to enable people to do training like ours remotely. But if you can attend in person, then the GI Bill is an option. However, there's another option, and I personally feel like this is one of the best options out there, and it's also the least known about. It's called VRNE. Letters VRNE stands for Vocational Rehabilitation and Employment. It used to be called Voc Rehab in VA circles. It's now called VRNE. Google that VA VRNE. 
if you are already a veteran or you're getting ready to get out and you have a disability rating and it is a lower threshold than you would think, I don't know the exact number, but it's not like you don't need to be 100% disability rated with the VA to get VRE. It's it, you can get it at a much lower threshold. We've had numerous students come through using VRE. It will pay the whole tuition, it will give you a living stipend, and they'll even buy you a laptop. So it's a great, great option. So go on the VA's website. You can apply to VRE on the VA's website uh, if you're already registered with the VA. And if you're not, then do so because you're going to have to do it anyway. Um, so GI Bill, VRE, great options. Again, GI Bill in person only. VRE will allow you to do it remotely. And basically on, on the student end, it works just like vet tech. Uh, it'll pay the tuition and it'll pay your living stipend. The difference is on our end, with vet tech, there's some stipulations, but that those don't even matter anymore because it may change when they if they ever enact that rule. But on the student end, it works right. So look into VRE. And, the, and for the record, if you can't use either of those, we have scholarships. We have numerous scholarships that apply to everyone. We do everything we can to make sure that tuition itself is not a factor. Our scholarships are not going to come with the living stipend aspect that a VA method would have, unfortunately. But they, in terms of tuition, please do not let tuition be a barrier to attendance. We'll do everything we can to make sure you can attend uh, on that aspect. Um, I'm going to jump forward just a little bit because I think yeah. this we can knock this question out while we're still on the topic and then we'll go back and get everyone else's questions. Thank you for all the questions, by the way. But um, if vet tech isn't around, what is the likelihood of obtaining a Skillbridge scholarship? And um, if you need it, it is very high. <laughs> that's what I'll say. Greg, do you have anything different to say? No, that, that's exactly perfectly said. Like if you're if you're a Skillbridge student and you're accepted to Code Platoon, like this is one of those weird areas of compliance that I think like military people can kind of see through. I and I pay attention when I say this, this is one of those military footstop moments. I can't guarantee a scholarship. We cannot guarantee a scholarship. The verbiage of guarantee is bad, right? But if you if you pass the application and you get accepted and you're a Skillbridge student, there is a very 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 high chance of you getting a scholarship. So read between the lines, move forward accordingly. Um, I think there is another CSB Skillbridge question um, regarding timeline. Uh, let's see. I guess since we're coming up on an hour, I can probably try to summarize as much of these as if I possibly can. Uh, what happens is a live assessment doesn't go well. I can, I'll answer that really quick. You're going to have another chance. This is not like, oh, you didn't do well on the live assessment. Boom, you're gone. No, no Guillermo is going to talk with you and tell you what to work on and give you another chance to do it. He gives multiple chances to, to people. And we have numerous people who have come through the program who have had done it multiple times. So that's okay. Not a problem. Uh, Just make sure you plan we... ahead and you don't like put off the technical assessment to the last possible set moment. That way you have a chance to improve upon the skills that are suggested to you before you do it again. To reference back what I said earlier, the, the, the welcome call, you're going to, if you're already going to start talking with Guillermo when he accepts you or doesn't accept you, because he's going to be the one who evaluates your application. I'm going to tell you a fundamental to both military and business life that you've heard a hundred times, but you're going to hear it again right now. Communication, communication, stay in communication with him because he's going to tell you what you need to know. As long as you stay engaged with him and communicate with him, he is going to walk you through that process and tell you everything you need to know. The people who don't do well, and the reason I stress this is because the people who don't do well are the people who drop off the map. He will email them and he will to ask them like, what are you, when do you want to schedule this? And they don't respond. So stay engaged, stay communicative with the, the people who are helping you and you'll do just fine. Um, can VA fund online class? Yeah, I, I, I kind of address that, but again, VRE, yes, they will fund the online program. So VRE will, GI Bill will not. Uh, vet tech is up in the air. If vet tech comes back between now and the end of the year, then we'll have that conversation. Um, but VRE, yes, GI Bill, no. Uh, Austin, okay. did we get your CSP Skillbridge question? The timeline on Skillbridge, here's the bottom line on the timeline. I'll tell you right now. The big thing with CSP Skillbridge, 
I need on my end, I need a commander approval. I need a commander, your commander to sign off and say, say, yes, this person can attend from this date to this date. That's all I need. And this is the important part. I only need that for you to attend the program. We do not need that to accept you into the program. We don't need it for you to start the pre-work. We don't need it for anything other than the actual cohort. If you get that, it's this, this is not ideal, but if you got to, that to me the day before, or even this happened once, we got it the morning of the cohort actually beginning, we'll still accept you. You're still good to go. So you don't need the, the, that, that command approval. You don't need that to be accepted. You need it to attend. So as long as you keep that in mind, and really that commander approval, that's it. That's all I need. I, and that comes in different forms. It depends on if you're from the Air Force, they I sometimes I, I swear that they think that they can do it on a cocktail napkin and be like, yeah, you're good to go. And they don't really like the Air Force has the least amount of strict requirements as far as what needs to be done. And the Army has the most and the Marine Corps and the Navy fit somewhere in between those. So, uh, yeah, let's see what else. VR, VR and E. Yeah, there you go. Kayla already answered that. Uh, VR and E be used with SkillBridge. Um, I think technically it could, but I think in that case, we would use a, we would probably use a uh, SkillBridge scholarship because the VA will not let you double dip on stipend. Um, so here's why I say that. On your end, it's not going to matter. Uh, for a student who says, can I use VR and E or SkillBridge? For SkillBridge, you're still in the military, which means you're still collecting a paycheck. You're still, you know, receiving all the benefits from the military. The VA won't let you double dip on that. They're not going to give you a living. And this was true for vet tech as well. They wouldn't give you a housing stipend. It's just for tuition. So in that case, I wouldn't use VRE for that if I were in your shoes. Um, I would just use the SkillBridge scholarship because again, you're not, it's not going to matter on your end either way. And that way you, it kind of frees up your VRE for later. The only, and it would be harder for you, by the way, it would be harder for you to get VRE if you're still active in the last six months because you do have to meet with a VA counselor. And it's, again, it's a low threshold, but it is tied to a disability rating. So if you don't have a disability rating yet, when a lot of people who are still active duty in the last six months don't have one yet. So if you don't have a disability rating, they're probably not going to authorize it anyway. So I would I would pursue the scholarship personally. Uh, one more clarifying question for the CSP timeline. Yeah, go ahead. We got a couple more minutes left. Austin, you can ask it. Or I see ask them it unmuted, but I can't hear them. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining us. We got a couple minutes left. So Austin, if you have a yeah, question. Yeah, on, there we go. Yeah, Austin's gonna use my computer. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. So oh, you thanks, got Tom. An basically what I, I have we have several of us in the uh in our office that are retiring all roughly at the same time, right? Okay. Um so one of the guys is gonna be retiring at a point where the the cohort and the CSP timeline are gonna have a bit of a gap. Um, so mm -hmm. what I mean is like your cohort would start maybe a couple of weeks prior to when he would be technically authorized to start a, a CSP. Now, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be any problem at all getting command approval here. Um, we're very fortunate in that respect. Um, on your guys's end, you know, is a memo from commander saying, hey, this guy's good to start right now. Good enough to get him into your cohort. Um, maybe not yes. officially under a CSP title. Okay. Yes. So short answer to that is, is again, as long as your commander authorizes something, we're good. Uh, okay. the, the 180 day mark, and I think what you're referring to is, you know, when you're authorized to start at the 180 days out from your final date, that really, that's the DOD guidelines. But the, what I need, as long as you, we have a commander saying, yes, this individual can attend from X date to Y date. I don't care if it's, we really, it doesn't matter at all on our end if it happens to be a week before that 180 days starts. Doesn't doesn't impact us whatsoever. As long as your commander authorizes it, we're good. That's easy. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, you bet.
yeah, we want to work work with you to make it work on that sense. Even if there were issues the other way, we have done before. I know we had someone whose skill bridge didn't start until like a week or two after classes started, but they were able to take leave for the first two weeks to like make it work. Uh, we will make it work if there's uh, some gaps and we you need help like aligning your um, program with SkillBridge. Yeah, the, sh the short answer to all SkillBridge questions is I can about 100% guarantee you that we are more flexible than your command. Um, that's always the case. Like we're we're going to work with you. It's it's the command side of things that's always the hiccup. Right. Some and some people's commanders are great, like their individual commander is great, but then they encounter some some logistical hoop that they got to jump through at a higher level. Uh, again, we'll work with it. We'll, we want it. We want Skillbridge people. That's been a, an initiative for us for the last several years. So if you can make it work, we'll make it work. And Greg actually is our like SkillBridge enrollment coordinator. So, Greg, why don't we get put your email in the chat? So yes. if any of you. Well, also, those of you who are not using SkillBridge, but if any of you using SkillBridge want a chance, like, want to talk to him directly about, like, your specific situation, you are more than welcome to do so. I accidentally messaged that to Kayla. That I gotcha. Good. No worries. Okay. Um, but yeah, like she said, I'm the official SkillBridge point of contact. I'll be signing your paperwork and working with you to make sure all of that is good we got all, all the you know lines crossed and eyes dotted and all that fun stuff so i'm happy you know email me if you have any direct questions any any strange things i've dealt with some weird things over the last year with skillbridge where especially in the navy the requirements changed and yeah but we we are flexible that's the bottom line we're flexible and really at the end of the day as long as i have a commander signature saying you can attend I'm good with it. We the the skill bridge thing is so not uniform DOD wide that they have no way of saying you didn't do it right. Well, nobody's doing it right. I mean, literally, that's the only real requirement is you making sure you have the time off and your commander says, yes, you're good to go. All right. We are a little over time. I have some extra time, so I don't mind going over. Greg, how are you looking on your calendar? I'll give you a couple more minutes. Okay. If anyone has any other questions, go ahead and ask now. Yeah. Feel free to ask another question or, or uh, you know, email me either way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step off. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah, no problem. Have a good one. You as well. Wow. <laughs> Say bye. That's a, that's a cute voice right there. <laughs> yeah. You hear that? <laughs> Good bunny. She's trying to give me a booger. So it's nice. I saw I saw a little shape running around there back back there a minute ago. So it's <laughs> that's great. Any other questions? Anybody? Anything? Anything at all? No. Nothing. If not, that. Like I said, last last bit of advice, everybody check number one, email me with the detailed questions you have. Number two, check out our YouTube page. We've got so much stuff on there that will answer questions and help you out. So if there are no other questions. Thank you all for joining us today. Yes. Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you all in the near future.